So I'm going to be mainly addressing the children, and if the children get stumped, then we'll ask the adults. You ready? Some Prahlad Maharaj questions. Lord Nishinga Day, Prahlad Maharaj. Because I understand that our group of young devotees here, you know a lot about Prahlad at Lord Nishinga Day. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you got to raise your hand though. You can't just like, no, I didn't even ask the question yet. <laughs> I'll ask a question. And when you're ready with the answer, after you hear the question, then you can raise your hand. Okay. Should I ask an easy one or a difficult one? Difficult. Okay. <laughs> I'll start with a kind of an easy one. Don't speak it out loud. You've got to raise your hand. You ready? What... What was the yuga, the yuga that Lord Yashingadeva appeared? What was the name of the yuga that Lord Yashingadeva appeared? You wanted a difficult one. <laughs> yes. Uh, Trita? Almost. Go ahead. Um, Starts with an S. Satya. Satya, you got it. Satya yuga. Okay, and here's a more difficult one. Prahlad Maharaj was the son, who was the father and the mother, the name of the father and the mother. No, that's the father. The name of the mother was? Kayadu. Kayadu. Did you know? He knew. Say, the name of the mother was? Kayadu. You, well, we got two, that's good enough. <laughs> and who was Hiranyakashipu before he was Hiranyakashipu? Who was he in his previous life? Who was Hiranyakashipu before he was Hiranyakashipu? Go ahead. That, that man who, um, ki who, whose eighth son was destined to kill him. I forgot his name, but... Go ahead. Kamsa? No. That came later. Kamsa came later. And he actually, well, he actually was not even later. He was a different yuga and a different person. Yeah. Huh? Jai Vijay. Jai Vijay. <laughs> but which one? Jai or Vijay? I don't know. Well, there were two gatekeepers of Vaikuntha, and their names were? Jai, Jai and Vijay. What's up? Nothing. You're raising your arm. What's. You got an itch? Vijay. Jai and Vijay. Jai and Vijay? Vijay. 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 Who, well, who was the older brother between... Okay, Hiranyakashipu had a brother. What was the brother's name? Hiranyaksha. Hiranyaksha. Older brother, Hiranyakashipu. Younger brother? Hiranyaksha. And one of them was Jai and the other one was Vijay. Because those Jai and Vijay, they're the gatekeepers of Vaikuntha, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Jai became Hiranyakashipu and Vijay became the younger brother Hiranyaksha. You thought Hiranyakashipu was what? Twins. They were twins, but one was born before the other one. One was older. They weren't born at the same time. They were twins, but one was born first and the other was born second. Is that all right? One was the older brother, the younger brother, but they were twins. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Okay, so now wait a minute. Don't talk out of turn. Don't talk out of turn. You got to raise your hand. <laughs> Boy, she's really enthusiastic. <laughs> Better stop the question. We got these kids going. So, <clears throat> next question. No one's raised your hand. I haven't even asked a question. <laughs> Who was the spiritual master of Prahlad Maharaj? Everyone's hand should be up. Who was the spiritual master of Prahlad Maharaj? Who? Vishnu. No, that was his worshipable master. Who was his spiritual master, his teacher? His spiritual master was Narada Muni. Narada Muni. Right? Narada Muni. So, you answered it. <laughs> huh? You answered it. Okay, but well, she answered it. I just repeat, didn't you say Narada Muni? Yeah. Okay, she answered it. Well, you couldn't hear her, but I could. She was speaking to me. Narada Muni. Narada Muni. Calm down. <laughs> I would be a terrible Sunday school teacher. <laughs> so, because Narada Muni was the spiritual master of Prahlad Maharaj, he became a devotee of Lord Vishnu. And who was the enemy of Haranyakashipu? Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu, he, he became the enemy of Hiranyakashipu, why? Reason? Uh, over here. He became a boar and killed his brother? Yeah, Vishnu killed his brother, he's my enemy. Now his son is devoted to his enemy, Lord Vishnu, so he decided, you're my enemy. And then what did he do when he decided he was his enemy? Over here, the, he tried to kill him. But he couldn't kill him. This and that and the other thing, we all saw it Friday evening. You probably know the whole story. We saw the images, this and that. So then what happened? What happened next? So Prahlad said... No, before that, before that, before Prahlad said... What happened? What, did, what was Hiranyakashipu's reaction? I'm the most powerful person in the universe! And this little boy is more powerful than me? He felt an emotion he never felt before. He felt fear. He was afraid. This little boy is more powerful than me. So then what happened? The teachers, who were the names of the teachers? Raise your hand, don't say it out loud. I only see one hand. Names of the teachers were, go ahead. Starts with an S and an A. Teachers' names. Sanda and Amarka. Sanda, or Shanda and Amarka. Teachers' names. Oh, oh yeah, now I remember. And they were the sons of who? Two boys, two brothers. They were the sons of? Who's the spiritual master of Hiranyakashipu? And the, you know, the teacher, the guru of the demons. What's his name? Who's the spiritual master of the demigods? Starts with a B. Brahaspati. Oh yeah, Brahaspati. And the spiritual master of the demons. No. He was a king. Spiritual master. Who's the this, his name? Maybe you remember his name this way. Who's the one who told Bali Maharaj? 
don't give three paces of land to Vama and Dev. Because he'll take everything. His name was? Shukracharya. Shukracharya was the spiritual master of the demi demons. And he had two sons whose names were? Shanda and Amarka. Shanda and Amarka. Hey, don't play with that. Shanda and Amarka. So, Shanda and Amarka said to Hranikashipu, don't worry, he's a little boy, he'll get over this, we'll teach him how to be a nice demon, how to dislike Vishnu, we'll, we'll train him up. He didn't know what else to do, he was, he tried to kill him and nothing could happen. So then, then what happened next was, one day the, the two teachers had to go home and take care of some household duties, so they left the classroom. And what do kids do when the teacher leaves the classroom? They play, that's what they do. So the boys wanted to play. Pilad, come on, let's play. And he said, no. Even when you're very young, very famous verse, chapter 6 of Canto 7. Komaran acharet pragyo. Does anybody know the verse? Dharman bhagavataniha. Manusham. You know the verse? Dolabham janma. So, even when you're little, how old are you? What's your age? How many years old? You forgot. <laughs> you're three years old. And you're learning about Prahlad when you're three years old. You're very fortunate. Prahlad said when you turn five, that's when you start going to school. You plan to go to school when you're five? She's looking at Dad. She's shrugging. <laughs> You'll probably go to school when you're five. So when you're five, that's when you really seriously begin to start learning about Vishnu Bhakti or Krishna Bhakti. Because the verse says, this human form of life, although it's temporary, it's very special. The special thing about this human form of life is you can realize who you are beyond the coming and going of the temporary bodies. So he speaks about two chapters, two chapters speaking about Vishnu Bhakti. And they go, wow, this is good. Where'd you learn it? He said, Narada Muni. And then he explained more and more and more and more. At the end, they got up and had kirtan, little boys in the school. And then what happened? The teachers came back. Oh, oh. they're doing kirtan to Vishnu. I'm going to tell Hiranyakashipu, you're in trouble. And sure enough, he was in trouble. Hiranyakashipu then decided, not just my guys, I'm going to kill my son. He was, he was a very mean guy. But something else happened. Lord Nishingadev appeared and finished Haranyakashipu and finished all the soldiers of Haranyakashipu and was roaring. Much louder than that, too. <laughs> so the demigods came forward and they offered prayers. And the Lord was still roaring. He was so angry. Don't mess with Prahlad. You're in trouble. So they went to Prahlad. Lord Brahma and Narada Muni and the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, couldn't do anything to pacify him. So they, they requested Prahlad to offer prayers. So he offered many, 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 many prayers. A whole 55 
verses of prayers. And then what happened? Then what happened? Yeah. To take a benediction. Anything. I'm the giver of all desires of all living entities. I've got a big warehouse behind me. I got lots of stuff in my warehouse. What do you want? You want a new cell phone? <laughs> you want a new computer? You want what do you want? Don't, you don't do you you're not you're not Pravat. <laughs> But so that's where we're going to now begin. You got to get ready because we're going to go through it twice. We're going to go through the first 10 verses of chapter 10. And it's recorded. So you can just listen carefully and we'll see on the screen the image and you'll hear the recording. Hopefully technology is going to work. Let's see. Not working. Can you please connect me once? Mm -hmm. We had the same problem the other evening. Prahlad Maharaj said, My dear Lord, O oh Supreme Personality of Godhead, because I was born in an atheistic family, I'm naturally attached to material enjoyment. Therefore, kindly do not tempt me with these illusions. I'm very much afraid of material conditions and a desire to be liberated from materialistic life. It is 
is for this reason that I have taken shelter of your lotus feet. Oh, my worshipable Lord, because the seed of lusty desires, which is the root cause of material existence, is within the core of everyone's heart. You have sent me to this material world to exhibit the symptoms of a pure devotee. Otherwise, O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Instructor of the entire world, you are so kind to your devotee that you could not induce him to do something unbeneficial for him. On the other hand, one who desires some material benefit in exchange for devotional service cannot be your pure devotee. Indeed, he is no better than a merchant who wants profit in exchange for service. A servant who desires material profits from his master is certainly not a qualified servant or pure devotee. Similarly, a master who bestows benedictions upon his servant because of a desire to maintain a prestigious position as master is also not a pure master. Oh, my Lord, I am your unmotivated servant, and you are my eternal master. There is no need of our being anything other than master and servant. You are naturally my master, and I am naturally your servant. We have no other relationship. My Lord, best the givers of benediction. If you at all want to bestow a desirable benediction upon me, then I pray from your Lordship that within the core of my heart there be no material desires. Oh my Lord, when a human being 
is able to give up all the material desires in his mind, he becomes eligible to possess wealth and opulence like yours. We'll discuss these verses. There's just ten, and there's a, a logic to them. Let me first ask you all a question from what we just heard. We heard about who was Rani Kashipu before he was a Rani Kashipu. Who was Prahlad Maharaj before he was Prahlad Maharaj? It's right in the verses that we just heard. He says in one of the verses that all oh, Lord Yashinga Dev seeing in this world a place that is so much filled with the modes of passion and ignorance, you sent me. Where did he send him from? To the spiritual world. By Kunta. To teach the way of pure devotional service. There's another explanation because let's do this one. Our children are getting a little restless. I can see. Uh, how many yoga cycles are there? Eighteen, right? No. How many? How many? Four. Four. What are the names? Go ahead. Satya. Satya. Next one. Treta, the next one. Go ahead. Uh, Sata Treta. And that's our that's our present one. When Krishna appeared, what yoga was that one? It starts with a D. Yeah, go ahead. Dwarfa, right. <laughs> so let's do it again. Satya. Treta, that's when Lord Ramachandra appeared. Dwarapa Yuga, that's when Krishna appeared, and Kali Yuga, that's when Lord Chaitanya appeared. <coughs> so Satya Yuga, Lord Yashinga appears in Satya Yuga. So just as there's there's four yugas, so the means I think I'm losing the audience here. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> we need a movie. <laughs> then they can pay attention. You want a movie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're not going to have one. <laughs> I don't know what to do. When the natives get restless, what do you do? <laughs> We don't have a movie for 
movie to show. You want to go watch a movie, go watch a movie. Yay. I'd be a terrible Sunday school teacher. <laughs> at least for little ones, I wouldn't make it. Okay, those of you that have restless children, you know what to do, right? Please do the needful, because I don't know what to do when this happens. Uh, yeah. There's cycle of four yugas, and then they cycle again, just like summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall. So, in each of these yugas, Lord Yashringadeva appears, but it's not always the same pralad. Or it's not that Prahlad come from the spiritual world because how do we know that? We know that from a wonderful book written by Sanatana Goswami, one of the principal associates of Lord Chaitanya, Sanatana Goswami, who wrote a book that teaches how to observe Nishina Chaturdasi. What's Nishinga Chaturdasi? That's the day that Lord Nishinga Dev appears. So, how to observe it is to explain in Sanatana Goswami's book like this. Are you paying attention or you're restless? Somewhere in between. <laughs> Not really paying attention. Somewhat restless. Okay, so, Prahlad asks Lord Yashinide, how did I become so devoted to you like this? How did it happen? Lord Yashinide gives him the answer. In your previous life, you were Brahman. Now you're the son of Ranikashipu. But in a previous life, you were a Brahmana, very much like the Ajamdiva story, but you didn't do any Brahminical activity. You didn't read the scripture, you didn't, you didn't do anything. In fact, and when you grew up, you became a very fallen person. You lived in criminal ways, and you kept company of a prostitute, and you were a bad person. But one good thing you did your whole life, and that's why you became for life. So what was that one good thing? Well, you and your girlfriend, one day you got in an argument. You got really upset, and you couldn't you couldn't eat or sleep. You fasted all day, and it just happened to be my appearance day. And because of that, you took birth as Prahlad. Now you become my devotee. And the girl, she also fasted that night. And after her life, she became an apsara. What's an apsara? It's a, what's that? Huh? A dancer. A dancer, yeah. In the heavenly realm. And then after that she went to the spiritual realms. And you, you're going to rule the kingdom of your father for 60,000 years. And then you go back to Godhead. No, 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 no. So, who was he in his previous life? He was a Brahmana. So, but the Prahlad Maharaj from this uh, seventh canto, chapter 10, he's from Vaikuntha. So it's not always from the same place. But it's basically the same pastime of the Supreme Lord again and again and again. He enjoys his pastimes and Prahlad assists him in his pastimes and they have loving dealings between the two. So I'm going to mute this so we can go on. And we're going to cover the ten verses and we're done. Yay. <laughs> you want to say something? What's yeah. up? So, so if, if a Brahmana fast, they will automatically... Not automatically. <laughs> There's nothing automatic in Krishna consciousness. But he, he Krishna can show his mercy. So if I fast, I will become a Brahmana next time? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> no. You're eligible for some mercy. And how Krishna wants to give his mercy is up to him, right? He didn't like sign a contract or anything. <laughs> Where did he? When you get mercy. You want mercy? Sure, okay. Okay, so now let's go. Now this is Narda speaking. In, in the the whole of the seventh canto is Narda speaking to Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Narda is speaking to Maharaj Yudhisthira, describing all of this. Saying when Prahlad heard from his from Lord Yashinidev, you can take any benediction you want. And I'm the fulfiller of all desires, so you name it, it's yours. Prahlad didn't feel good about that. Prahlad thought, this is going to be an impediment in my life, in my relationship with Lord Vishnu. So he decided to reply in the following way. And he speaks words of humility because he's a pure devotee. And that's how pure devotees see themselves and that's how they speak. Um, born in an atheistic family, all I know is material attachment. No, he learned from Narada Muni otherwise, but he's speaking of himself as if he's not the elevated person that he is. Filled with attachment to material enjoyment. Therefore, please don't tempt me. You give me something and I'll just go, wow, I got something and I'll be the enjoyer of that something and my material consciousness will just get inflated. So, no thank you. The material conditions of life is something I'm very, very conscious about. And to protect myself for that reason, I'm taking shelter of you. You're everything for me, so don't, don't tempt me with these, these other things. Now, twice he uses in these ten verses this word lusty. Lusty doesn't just mean, you know, we'll say what it does mean. Lusty means there's a sense object, let's just say, there's this um, big ice cream container out there in the kitchen. And you go by and you, wow, ice cream. And mom and dad say, it's not offered to Krishna yet. So don't look at it like that because it's not prashadam. It's got to be offered to But lust, in that sense, means wanting the senses to be the enjoyer of sense objects. <coughs> and that's there. We take, we take a material body, we take birth because of that tendency to be the enjoyer of material objects, independently of Krishna. That's why we get one of these things, material body. It's built into the machine because it's in the core of the heart. And that's the cause of our material existence. So, because in this world, there is such a tendency. You sent me. And he sent him from Vaikuntha because Prahlad is an eternal resident of Vaikuntha. And he descends, he's Vaikuntha Vasi. And he descends here and lives like a Vaikuntha Vasi, even he's here. Resident of Vaikuntha. No anxiety. No material desire. Then he's, these, these verses, he's teaching the way of pure devotional service. He is fulfilling the mission that Lord Vishnu sent him here for. What's that? To teach the way of pure devotional service. So here's the way of pure devotional service. What's the way of pure devotional service? Between you and me, there's only one thing. You're the master. I'm the servant, 
I'm not coming to you for something. I will do a service to you. You will give me something in back in return. That's a, how a merchant behaves. Banik is the word that's used in the Sanskrit. You probably get that word from Hindi. I don't know Hindi, but I know that word. Merchant. So if I come to you and I do some service and I'm expecting something back from you, I'm no better than a merchant. And similarly, uh, one who desires profit from the master, that's not a true devotee. And the master who wants to give something to the servant or the devotee so that he'll be nicely devoted and he'll have followers. That's not a good master either. Rather, the way of pure devotional service, without motivation, there's only one thing between us. You're the master, I'm the servant, squeaky clean. There's nothing else going on. So as soon as, it's like Hanuman, <coughs> one famous example of one who's a servant of Ram. If Ram wants something, Hanuman's there waiting. And as soon as he hears Ram wants something, there he goes. You get what Ram wants. Here he comes back. It's done. What's next? And then the next service, and a life of service. That's the position of Pavad. That's the mood of a, of a pure devotee. Unmotivated, no obstacle, unconditional service. We're almost done. If you really want to give me a benediction, here's one. From the core of my heart, take away all material desire. He doesn't have any. But we have any. We have, a, you know, two or three of them, maybe. A few million. So we ask that that desire for material, and material enjoyment means something separate. We're discussing that word in the Bhagavatam class from the morning class, Pratak. That the separatist mentality. The interest of the Supreme Lord is over there. My interest is over here. Please fulfill my interest. Thank you very much. That's material. And non, no, and take away material desire so that all that's left is one thing. Your desire. Your desire is what's my desire. That's called love. And this opposite, this lusty, I want to be the enjoyer, something separate from me, then all good qualities become destroyed. A nice phrase is asat trishna. Trishna means thirst, the thirst for the temporary. And those that have this thirst for the temporary, all their good qualities become vanquished. We're almost done. Next to the last verse. So Pallad is saying, one who comes to this stage where they have no material desire, then Krishna can really load them up with all kinds of opulence, all kinds of power, all kinds of anything and everything without contaminating the heart of the devotee because they don't really want anything. If something comes, they use that in Krishna's service. In Goloka Vrindavan, would you like to go to Krishna Loka someday? Yes? Why would you like to go there? It's very opulent. But the devotees, all the trees, listen to this, all the trees are desire trees. That means you go to any tree, there's lots of trees out here in Phoenix, little guys. But by the temple, there's this banded tree, it's really slow, you can Anyway. Trees in the spiritual world not only produce a certain kind of leaf or flower or fruit, unlimited, not just any fruit or any flower, anything, on unlimited quantities at any time you want. 
So one would think, gee, that's a nice place. People must be really opulent here. But they live very simply because all they want, they only want one thing, service to Krishna. So the trees provide them what they need for service to Krishna. Very happy place. They're not living opulently, they're living happily. They have what they need for service to Krishna without limit. The here things are made of cement and wood and steel and you know material elements. There everything is made of chintamani. What's chintamani? It's conscious stone. It's a gem. It's luminous. It doesn't need to be lit up. It's self-luminous. And it's fully conscious. And it's, it's also fulfills, in fact, the cows, everything in the spiritual world, everything in the spirit in Goloka Vrindavan fulfills all desires. But there's only one desire. Krishna's happiness. And all the entities in that, you know, the, the river Jamuna and Govardhan Hill and you name it. It's just fulfilling the desires to please Krishna. But there isn't any other desire except wanting to please Krishna. It's total harmony. No war. No highways. No taxes. You don't even have to go to school. Yay, let's go. No. But you already you're you're, all, you're filled with knowledge. Such as Ananda, you already know everything you need to know. Isn't that nice? Let's go. What's holding us back? <coughs> We're attached to the temporary. That's what's holding us back. So Pallada is requesting, please take material desire from my heart. And then you can load me up with all kinds of everything, and it won't become disturbed. And here's the last verse. Oh, my Lord, full of six opulences, O Supreme Person, O Supreme Soul, killer of all miseries, O Supreme Person, in the form of a wonderful lion and man, let me offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Okay, I think we've extended ourselves more than really need to try. Well, there's not so many of the young kids left. <laughs> Some got understandably restless. So, any discussion, we'll start with our younger devotees and see if you have... You've got several questions. You've had several questions. You have some more? Go for it. Krishna can expand himself as one Krishna. Right? How many, uh, how many humans, there's some plants and things like that, but how many of us are here in this room assembled? Roughly, what, 30, 35? So, listen, listen. That means there's 30, 35 living entities, souls, Right? And how many super souls are there? One. Okay. So Krishna is variously situated, but there's one super soul. Variously situated. So is Krishna many or is he one? He's one. But he's also many. He's in my heart. He's in your heart. So that's many. But he's one. At the same time. 
Now we can't be many and one at the same time. We can't even be many, we can be one. But Krishna can be many and one at the same time. Wow. <laughs> we weren't ready for that. You got another one? You're still digesting that one. <laughs> Well, he's very merciful, so he probably showed himself elsewhere. I can't, I'm not, a, I'm not aware at the moment, I'm not thinking of any other time that he appeared. But he's merciful, so he must have. Here's one answer. In the beginning of chapter 9, this is chapter 10. In the beginning of chapter 9, um, Narada Muni says that when the demigods requested Prahlad to go forward and offer prayers, even the goddess of fortune was afraid. Adibhuta is the word that she was meaning. She was astonished. And our Acharya Vishwanath says she was astonished because although she had seen him before in the spiritual world, because she's the goddess of fortune, so she's with him in the spiritual world. And in different yuga cycles, she saw him because she's with him even in different yuga cycles. So she saw him before, but she became astonished as if she had not seen him before. And was afraid. But that was by the Lord's internal potency. Now, it, it, all, it, all it's saying there is, from scriptural reference, he had other appearances, but who else was present besides Prabhad? At least other demigods were there because the demigods change in yoga cycles, right? Got the other question? It'll come up. Anyone else? Amongst the kids. Any comments, questions, any thoughts? You got something churning over there. Anything? No. Okay. Any of our adults? Any comments or questions? Yes. So, <clears throat> in my sources, he said, you know, that uh, I have this, you know, lust, uh, lust and desire in my heart. So, and uh, I think you also mentioned that we have to cleanse them before we can go back to Vaikuntha. So, if we have, so does that mean that, you know, if we have even one desire, we'll keep coming back to Madhya? Not, not necessarily. The, 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 the art is transforming lust to love. And that's the bhakti process. So, let's just give this example of ice cream, because kids like ice cream. So, if I think ice cream is nice, let me make some really nice ice cream for Krishna. And offer it to Krishna. Krishna will like it. So we think instead of lust, we think love. Yes? Oh, that's something that I actually heard this morning. That in this material world, there is no such thing as love. Meaning? There's, there's only the love of God. Yeah. The, so that would be us love is other down here to transform it yeah. into the love yeah. of God. Love is otherworldly. Yeah. 
Okay. So, thus, beca can become otherworldly. Not like my enjoyment, but Krishna's enjoyment. The senses engaged in the service of the master of the senses. Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevana. Yes. Yes. So math, maybe math, maybe add up, or maybe I didn't know correctly. No, you got it.